John, was it possible for our policymakers to truly understand the way Iraqis would have reacted? The judges made here were that when we went in, we would be greeted as, quote, liberators, mm -hmm. the, quote, Dick, Vice President Cheney's phrase, that they were prepared, in, a, in effect, to take governing into their own hands, that they were so upset and had been so downtrodden by Saddam Hussein that they would embrace democracy and rise up almost immediately. Well, first of all, I think, again, uh, it, to be fair, American troops were greeted as liberators. We saw it. It mm -hmm. lasted very briefly. It was exhausted quickly by the looting and the astonishment, the puzzlement, and finally the anger of Iraqis that nothing was, or very little was done um, to, to, uh, uh, to, to stop that. Um, I, I think that, to be fair to the United States, and I speak as a citizen of the United Kingdom, um, I think that the instincts that led to much that went wrong were good American instincts. The desire not to have too heavy a foot footprint, the desire to empower Iraqis. But, um, and I think that the policymakers in Washington, and to be honest with you, the journalists also, to speak for myself, um, completely miscalculated uh, the impact of 30 years of violent, brutal repression on the Iraqi people and their willingness in President Bush's phrase to stand up for themselves, to take authority, to take risks. Uh, why did we who, people like Rajiv and myself who were there under Saddam, why did we not fully understand that? I think it's because we were extremely limited by the Saddam's regime as to where we could go, what we could do, who we could speak to. And what we wrote about mostly, certainly I can speak for myself, was what was most palpable, most accessible to us, which was the terror. It was real. To that extent, I suppose you'd have to say that people uh, like, like myself enabled what happened, the decisions made here, to go into Iraq. And I'm not going to apologize for that. It, I've been to, I think, many of the world's nastiest places in a, a 30 year careers of foreign correspondent for the New York Times. And Iraq was, by a long way, saving only North Korea, the nastiest place I've ever been. It was a truly terrible place. And uh, what I think we were transfixed by was the notion that if you could remove this carapace of terror um, and you could liberate the Iraqi people, many good things can happen. We just didn't understand, and we perhaps didn't work hard enough to understand, what lay beneath this carapace, which was a deeply fractured society that had always been held together since the British constructed it by drawing geometric lines on the map. Winston Churchill and, and Lawrence of Arabia and Gertrude and Bell in the 1920s, a country that had really always been held together uh, by force uh, and varying degrees of repression. With the, the king, King Faisal is remembered, the, the king who was assassinated in 1958 as a kind of golden era, but even that was really, was not really a parliamentary democracy. It was still Repressive. basically an autocratic state. And I think that we needed to understand better the forces uh, that we were going to liberate. And I, I, my guess is that history will say that the forces that we liberated by invading Iraq were so powerful and so uncontrollable that virtually nothing the United States might have done except to impose its own repressive state with half a million troops, which might have had to last 10 years or more. Nothing we could have done would have effectively prevented this disintegration that has now occurred. Do you agree with that?